So welcome to the School of Education Doctoral Student Colloquium Series presentation. I am Tamara Galoyan, and I'm going to be the faculty moderator this afternoon. We are so pleased to welcome all of our virtual attendees, including School of Education faculty, staff, and students, the university body at large, community members, and partner associations, among others. The Doctoral Student Colloquium Series offers School of Education doctoral students an opportunity to share their original research and learn from their peers, faculty, and staff. Each month, one EDD and one PhD student presents their research at the colloquium, which is normally offered both on campus at Drexel University and online through Zoom. However, due to the COVID-19 global pandemic, all colloquium events for the 21-22 academic year will be held virtually through Zoom. These sessions help doctoral students to connect with each other and develop a peer community that is invaluable in supporting their journeys in the program. Each doctoral student presenter is also asked to write a research brief that relates to their presentation, which is then included in an edited publication titled Doctoral Student Research Briefs, published on the School of Education's website. The research brief is a way to disseminate our doctoral students' research as shared in the colloquium in a concise format with relevance to education. Each presenter will be provided 20 minutes to share his and her research we will then move on to question and answers following each presentation. Please save your questions for the end. You are welcome to type your questions in the chat area of Zoom or use your mic to ask questions. So let me now introduce our first presenter. Our first presenter, and just to let you know, each presenter will have 15 to 20 minutes. Um, our first speaker is Dara Bright who is a PhD student in the School of Education. Dara earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in government from the Co College of William and Mary and her Master of Science degree in public policy from Georgia Institute of Technology. While at Drexel University, she is a research assistant in the Methods Lab. Dara's research interests focus on utilizing measurement instruments to aid in understanding students' experiences and inform policies on closing the opportunity gap in K-12 STEM spaces and access to higher education. Today, Dara will be speaking about um, supporting nutrition and health choices for my minoritized children in urban settings. So at this point, we will take, um, we will ask Dara to um, present her work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Galoyan, um, for, the introduction, uh, for the introduction. As previously shared, my name is Dara Bright and I am a second year doctoral student in the School of Education. I'm studying both the intersection of marginalized students' experiences in STEM and the development of objective instrumentation. So I identify as a pragmatist scholar who often situates themselves in critical quantitative research. And so today I'll be presenting a research project that I had the privilege of working on entitled Seed System. Okay. So the project has two teams, the research and development team and the implementation team. The aims one through three that you see on the slide are the primary objectives of the implement implementation team who seek to increase nutrition and STEM literacy for minoritized urban families with preschool aged children. I am on the research team and we are focused on instrument development and validation to support and evaluate the impacts of AIMS 1 and 2. And so as a member of this team, we're tasked with understanding that or researching the outcomes of these AIMS. Oops, sped ahead. So right now the seed system project is in year one and we are in the curriculum and instru instrument development phase. So prior to assessing the impact of these aims, as I've previously stated, we're focusing on developing and validating instruments to measure preschool teachers' efficacy and beliefs and what they're presently doing in the classroom. And these preschool in-class surveys will serve as a pretest and a post-test instrument. So after the preschool teachers participate in our nutrition and STEM program, they'll be given the same set of surveys to evaluate, for us to evaluate, whether the programming was impactful. So to engage in this work, we utilize the validation evidence framework called the Standards of Educational and Psychological Testing developed by AERA, APA, and NCME in 2014. So here you have the five types of validity evidence that scholars should seek to do or evaluate and collect while doing instrument development. So the first type of validation evidence is content. 
And it ensures the aim of this, this validation evidence is to ensure that the instrument is aligned with the construct. So in our case, nutrition and teachers belief, we wanna make sure that the thing that we've created the survey aligns with what we know theoretically about both nutrition, teachers beliefs and content task. So for this type of ev evidence, we use subject matter experts. The second type of validity evidence response process ensures that the participants understand the items and their intended meaning. And so for this type of evidence, we use cognitive interviews, which I'll discuss more in future slides. The third type of validity evidence, consequential and bias, focuses whether or not there's a negative impact that the participants experience while completing the um, survey instrument. The latter two types of validity evidence are evaluated through Roche measurement analysis. And thus far, we've collected data on the first three types of valid valid validation evidence. And we are currently in the process of collecting data for the last two types of validity evidence. So to discuss more about this process, um, I'm going to talk about the procedures for collecting content validity evidence. So we have two teams. We have the um, Academy of Natural Sciences and Growing Great. So their focus was content and item alignment. Were there things missing? Are our items aligned with the standards created and are, are we making sure that what we're measuring matches? Is there alignment between these two? Whereas our subject matter experts provided with us was open-ended feedback. So they were a panel of experts with different expertise from assessment to preschool education and diversity and learning. And their feedback was based solely on their own backgrounds. And they were to give us whether or not um, our items contain bias or whether there was better wording. It was all open-ended. So based on the feedback from these two groups, we made modifications and before we moved on to the next stage. And so to talk about our findings, um, our Academy of Natural Sciences and Growing Great, our content task alignment, this um, green box here at the bottom, this green table, they indicated that they all, all items align with pre-K standards. And when we dig deeper into ways of modifying items, we looked at their open-ended feedback. We used a content analysis approach with multiple cycles of coding and four researchers. And so then we ended up with these five codes. So we have word choice, which is when we had an item that had was perhaps poorly worded or could have been worded just better. So an example was we changed the language in one item from exert to put forth. Missing content was, what, was when we noticed that, hey, there's something that we should probably consider adding. So an example would be for our science section, we considered adding a section that talked about when teachers record and share results of an experiment in their classrooms. And we did add that section. For clarification, it was to, to increase the understanding of the, what we're asking. So for instance, one of our um, subject matter experts indicated that literacy may not be clear to all preschool teachers. So we added a definition and our instructions. And then finally, misalignment. So there were no instances of misalignment um, but we did we had created this code prior to. And misalignment is this idea that there's no matching between, or there, there's an item that's mismatched with what we're seeking to measure. And then there's separate item. When there's an item that's double barreled. So we're asking, you know, do you do um, do you do comparison and do you do contrast? So the, or do you do comparison and do you have them record or share? And so we had a couple of items that. Uh, we have one item that we needed to break apart. And so we did that. So here, the procedures, um, we did cognitive interviews. And so there were two researchers who did cognitive interviews with nine preschool teachers. In general, each participant had one of the four teacher efficacy and beliefs um, items, and they had two content tasks. So the cognitive interviews, they're a think aloud process that allow us to do additional probing with a, when appropriate. So the way it works is that participants read the item, they select their answer, and they share their thought process on the answer selection. And occasionally we will do additional probing. So for instance, we'll say, okay, in this question, you know, the word encourage is here. Can you tell me what that means? Or the word high quality is here. What does that mean to you when you see this? And we want to make sure that when we have these words in here, that they have the intended meaning. And if they didn't, we would make the modifications accordingly. So for our findings, to analyze this data, we first look to make sure that the participants' answers align with their thought process. And all of our participants' response aligned with the researcher's intent. 
So this suggests that teachers were understanding the survey items and how to respond to them. And then we asked teachers to offer us feedback on items as we, that we analyzed through content analysis. So when they provided us feedback, we took, we took a content analysis approach similar to the way we did with the experts. And the results are shown here. And it led to five item level modifications. So for example, under our math item, the original item said something along the lines of sort objects using attributes such as color, shape. We had to modify this question because some um, of our participants indicated that the word attribute wouldn't necessarily be clear or they weren't necessarily sure what it meant. So we changed it to short, sort objects using characteristics. And then we, in our parentheses, we said color, shape, et cetera. All right. So finally, the last piece of evidence we collected was consequential evidence. And so the, we asked the participants, you know, were there any parts or items of the survey that made you feel uncomfortable? Did you feel like you want to stop at any point while completing this survey? Did your experience completing this survey feel differently or similarly to when you've completed other surveys in the past? And out of our nine pre-K teachers who participated, only one indicated that they experienced only one indicated that they experienced some discomfort when completing it. When we probed further, she shared that she felt uncomfortable because she didn't teach these science tests. Well, that led us to say that, well, you know what? We need to be really clear in our directions. So we use this information to modify the instructions, indicating that it's important for us to have a truthful answer from our participants so that we can measure growth. We indicated that the responses were not being used to measure whether they were high quality teachers but to help develop appropriate PD for pre-K teachers. We wanted to eliminate social desirability responses in this process. So next steps, we're currently collecting quantitative data from pre-K teachers to pilot our instruments. And this data will be used to form the latter two forms of evidence, validity evidence, both internal structure and the relationship to other variables. And we just want to note that this is a really long and iterative process. So it's crucial that when you're developing your own instruments, that they go through a very rigorous process of development and validation. And if you are choosing to select an instrument that's already been developed, it's really important that you have documented validity evidence aligned with its purpose. If you're not using a sound instrument, then you can't trust that you have sound findings. And that's really important here. Okay, and then finally, the connection to my work. So I, I share on this study that I'm participating in, but it's not my original work, but it's because my goal, my career trajectory is to go into methods and measurement. And I want, and the goal is for me to be an expert in how to develop and validate instruments, no matter what the content area is. And I have to know how to collaborate with different scholars in different fields, whether it's medicine, whether it's law, whether it's nutrition. Um, and my, uh, my job that what I seek to do is not to be a subject matter expert, but to know how to do measurement and how to validate instruments. Because what's really important to me is making sure that when we create assessments, that they're equitable for all students, that they're objective measures. And I think that a lot of that comes from my personal experience and personal exposure to instruments that weren't developed equitably, that, it, that they didn't, they were developed and they were targeting a specific audience. And as a result, you had kind of bad findings that weren't reliable and they weren't sound. So for my dissertation, I'm gonna go through this exact same process shown here, collecting the five types of validity evidence. And I'm also gonna do something called diff analysis as well, which is differential item functioning. Um, and I'm going to be using different content and subject matter experts, but this is the process that I will be going through. And now I am opening the floor for questions. Thank you, Dara, for the excellent presentation. Now you're welcome to ask your questions uh, related to Dara's presentation. You can either unmute yourself and ask the question or you can use the chat box. Thank you. Hi. Sarah, great presentation. Um, I have a question. So you briefly mentioned internal structure and relationship to other variables um, as types of validity evidence. But I just want to know, can you talk a little bit more of how you measure these? Yes, so thank you for that question. So the way you measure these two is psychometrically. You use Roche measurement. 
And what you'll look for for internal structure is you want to make sure that the items are, when you put it in ROSH, you want to make sure the items are performing appropriately. So we'll look at persons and we'll look at the items. How, how easy is it for people to agree with this item? How difficult is it for them to agree to this item? Are the, is the item performing poorly? Um, we have a couple of metrics. We look at infit, we look at outfit, point by serial. Um, we'll also look at Ann Rich's threshold to kind of gauge where is this item falling? And are people using our scale appropriately, right? So it's a four point scale, strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree. And we wanna make sure that people are understanding the differences between these. So we wanna make sure that each scale or each item is performing appropriately and that they have that participants know how to use the scale and if they don't we need to make modifications to the scale thank you for asking thank you any other questions uh i actually have a question dara so you mentioned the connection to your work your dissertation work and your work beyond the dissertation could you share a little bit more about that please so um my work is actually situated in higher education so i'm really interested in understanding financial stress what is the stress that college students experience and how are we measuring it and so currently the literature doesn't have a very um, psychometrically sound way of measuring financial stress and we know that it's one of the biggest um, indicators or leaders to attrition. And so if you don't understand, you know, how, what the threshold is, what are the high risk students? Who are they? What is the bracket or the level at which financial stress leads to attrition? And how can um, school and policymakers in higher education think about ways to catch and provide safety nets for these students? And so I want to, I want there to be a tool for higher education and admin to have to gauge um, annually, year round, what are how are our students doing financially? What are the supports we can put in place to make sure that we can keep them and so they can persist and we can retain them? So that is my work. My passion is access um, and equity. And so all of these things kind of tie in along those um, research agendas and research strands. Thank you for the question. Do we, do we have other questions in the chat? Let's see. Well, if you don't have any other questions to Dara, I would like to thank her again for her wonderful presentation and great discussion. And uh, now we will move on to our next presenter. Our second speaker is Dr. Caleb Mezzi, who earned his EDD from Drexel University in 2021. Dr. Mezzi's thesis centered on an analysis of the intersection of athletes and their career transition into retirement. This area is a passion and inspired Dr. Mezzi to create a consultancy, Greet and Glue, which uh, assists athletes to successfully transition from life after sports. Dr. Mezzi is an accomplished sports business professional and professor at Newman University in Aston, PA. This allows him to combine his passion for the business with his work, life, and teaching experience. His track record of building effective sports business relationships has resulted in the growth of sports organizations, nonprofit and for-profit, and successful careers for students under his guidance and mentorship at Newman. Dr. Mezzi is married with one son and another child expected in August. Congratulations, Dr. Mezzi. Uh, Dr. Mezzi enjoys collecting baseball cards, exercising on his peloton, and spending time with his family and dog. Today, Caleb will be speaking about developing a career transition model for professional baseball players. Thank you. Thank you. I see a lot of familiar names, some faces, and I'm happy to be here. Um, this is my first semester in three years where I'm not really with Drexel, so it's kind of weird, but I'm here. So give me one second. Everybody can see my screen. All right, I know we're all sick of hearing that. Okay. So usually this time of the year, um, everybody would be uh, watching baseball or at least understand that the season's about to change and we could get into baseball, but 
Before I introduce the problem that is baked into my research, I have to tell you that that's not the case this season. Um, there's going to be a delay in baseball, if at all. So I tell you that because there's some relevance um, to what I'm doing, to what I've done um, at my time at Drexel and the reason and the inspiration behind my dissertation and the focus. So as you can see, I did a Delphi study and as um, the introduction kind of stated, I developed a career transition model for professional baseball players. So here's the agenda I'm gonna run through. It's nothing um, spectacular. It's everything that you guys would expect in some research in the doctoral phase. As I mentioned, I already introduced um, the problem that exists right now with Major League Baseball, Major League Baseball Players Association, and they haven't reached a collective bargaining agreement, which means that there's a delay and slight cancellations in the season so far. But what this is going to do is it's gonna dovetail into a bigger problem where I'm gonna to present to you the problem that professional baseball players face in terms of the percentage, the numbers, all the data that tells you how tough it is to become a professional baseball player. And while many of you might say, hey, they're playing a kid's game, there's a bigger issue here um, and it is how they're not supported um, when their abbreviated career is cut short. Before I do that, I do wanna give some context to who I am and why this is the topic. The introduction really did a good job of detailing my historic background, my experience and education. But really for me, I've always loved baseball. It is a kid's game. It is something that I've grown up to love and really follow major and minor league baseball players. I've always wondered, you know, what happens to the player if they don't make it? What if their career is short? And that's kind of what brought me here. Um, being an educator, being someone who has been involved in baseball as a business, I've seen that there's a need to place education in a paramount setting for these baseball players when they are ready to retire or at least transition out. Let's get into my introduction. Here are some numbers I'm gonna throw at you and I want this to sit with you throughout this presentation. We're gonna come back to those. 90%, 90% of all baseball players will have their career and their contract terminated. It's very, 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 very seldom that you will be able to choose on your own to walk away. The Buster Posey example, uh, Buster Posey is you know, on his way to Hall of Fame. He's a catcher. He did that himself. He was able to choose that. He's rare. He's in that 10%. 1,500, that's another number I want you to know. 1,500 players are released or have their contracts terminated every year. Now, when I say 1,500, it's one thing to hear that number and think it's big. But now if we look at the next um, point there, Major League Baseball has 30 franchises. So that's 1,500 from each franchise. So that's, that's not a small number. And these are people who aren't really supported or aided in that transition out. They could be 23 years old. They could be 26. They could be 35. Whether or not they're 23 or 35, there is no transition programming. And I'm going to get into that. The other thing to know is that each franchise, there's 30 of them, have at least four levels. Rookie, A, A ball, double A, or triple A ball. Some of them have six affiliates. These, that's what these are called. So those are the levels that when you get drafted or signed, which we're going to talk more about, you have to climb that ladder to get to the major league um, show. So the minor league system is designed, as I just mentioned, many of these players are either signed as a free agent, almost like you would an employee contract or drafted um, in the first year player draft. <clears throat> the pl players who could be drafted could be high school age or college age or even older. That's also the rarity. The thing I want to tell you is the the dissertation that kickstarted this as a passion project for me is Amy Mobile in 2015 actually was dating, I think she was dating or engaged to a baseball player, Scott, who eventually became her husband, and he was a minor league baseball player with the New York Mets. At this time, she was um, getting her doctorate, and she saw that Scott and all his friends would just play video games when they weren't practicing or playing any game. And she said, what are you guys going to do if you don't make it? They didn't understand, what do you mean if I don't make it? I'm going to make it. And she didn't understand to them why they weren't preparing for a plan B or plan C. She did a quantitative, sorry, a qualitative study where she had, you know, informational interviews where she was understanding what they were prepared to do, what they weren't prepared to do, what support they had, what resources they had, and really found out that there was nothing. So that dissertation told me that there was a need for a model. As I mentioned, there is no sport career transition programming for baseball. There is for other um, athletic uh, athletes and, and people in athletic programs. I'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about the review of literature. Um, the other thing is, is 8% in 
in the first 10 rounds of that first player draft make it to the major leagues. And even if they do, the career duration is 5.6. Recently in 2021, that number has gone from 5.6 to 4 to 4. So what's happening is we're seeing a decline. It's shorter period of time in the major leagues, less amount of money. And as we see in the next bullet, the de that declines, that percentage declines for the later rounds. The draft is changing. It's part of the collective bargaining agreement. So I can't really give you guys too much information on what that will look like moving forward. But in previously, we've had 50 rounds, 40 rounds, 30 rounds, five rounds, 10 rounds. And, you know, there's talk about maybe making it three or five rounds, but that has not been decided yet. So as we see this, um, really this issue of the collective bargaining agreement continue to, to evolve and hopefully come to an agreement, we're going to see more issues come up around this topic. So the purpose, the purpose was to understand the career transition, identify um, what is out there, what is needed, um, how, ca how can we alleviate these issues, how can we kind of get these uh, first and foremost in front of them. The other thing, as I mentioned with the Amy Mobile Inspiration and her dissertation, it was to develop a career transition model. And at the end, I'm going to show you exactly how we did this. Um, the significance here is that much of career transition exists for military. If you look at the athletic sphere of that, it is for college athletes, so the student athletes, because they are at a higher ed, ed institution, you know, the numbers are stacked against them that they're not going to make it. And I'm sure you guys, if you watch March Madness, you see they're going to go on to be a pro in something else. And it's usually an enterprise commercial. But amateur athletes, professional baseball players, there's not much research out there. Right. So there was a, a reason that I wanted to look into this, and it's because very few research and no programming existed for professional baseball players. So I'm going to present this um, question to you. Um, I've already kind of introduced two problems, which is the collective bargaining agreement, the hiatus, the work stoppage, the lockout that is currently in baseball, but then also the abbreviated stay that baseball players have in their professional status. So I want you just to kind of um, digest this. We will have some um, exploration areas of more questions at the end that I want to kind of throw at you. Um, but for now, this is what what helped to kind of inspire, inspire, and then I'm gonna to get to the research questions next. So here are the research questions that guided my study. What strategies help assist athletes transition out of the sport and into the next career? What key factors are needed to assist these baseball players in the transition out of their sport? In what ways can these identified key factors, which we will get into, support the development of a transition model? And how could that be applied to help a, to make a successful transition for this professional baseball player when they leave their sport? Here's the conceptual framework that helped to guide the literature view. And then from the literature view, it helped to guide the instrument. So we took the transition guide, which is the 4S framework from Schlossberg and Kay. And we took the literature view and it helped to guide um, this 4S framework, which I'm gonna get into more. But the methodology here, and I'm gonna get into this even more, is the Delphi method. For those who do not know about the Delphi method, um, it is a very tedious process in terms of running this methodology. But at the end, when you start to see the product that comes from this methodology, it is amazing and it's totally rewarding. So those who are still looking into methodology, especially um, this is a popular methodology in healthcare. So I'm gonna get into a little more. So to understand the sport career transition, these are some quotes that I pulled from the research. The closer we strive to reaching an understanding of athletes and their career transition, the more visible gaps become the literature. This is so evident in this research right here, which is the gap is professional baseball players are not being addressed. There is no model that is supported by research and conducted by practitioners and subject matter experts. Other things that we've looked into is looking at the balance between accompanying these athletes during this crucial moment, right? But also preparing them early to allevi alleviate any negative occurrences, right? So you're gonna find out when you study career transition, if any of you choose to do that, that is an ongoing process, process, it is not a singular event. Once we know that it's not a singular event, that something happens and we have to address it, band-aid that up, what we can do is we can get ahead of that in the ongoing process early and often. This means that if someone is 26, what were they doing at 23, 24, 25, if they wanna retire at 26 and be prepared for their transition? Further, we looked at the existing career transition models. Some of these are sport related, some of them are not. I want you guys to just look at this. It is a lot to take in. Um, this is what a literature review really does. The next thing is to understand the factors that facilitate the transition. The factors that facilitate the transition were crucial for round one of my Delphi method. I'm gonna explain a little bit more about that, but 
understanding where we had these pillars that we can kind of start the conversation with our expert panelists and then allow them to identify other things or offer um, through qualitative responses what they believe is a factor that is missing that will allow other key factors to emerge. Less, uh, sorry, next part we're gonna get into is the methodology. For the methodology, I wanna talk now about the Delphi technique. The Delphi technique is a really good tool and methodology to forecast, meaning to look at a problem and say, we wanna forecast a solution here, how can we do that? The beautiful part about this is the collaborative opinion. To have a collaborative opinion, you need to seek and enlist expert panelists. So as Dara mentioned in hers, she had subject matter experts this is the same thing. We looked into subject matter experts and in the next slide I'm gonna get into exactly where those subject matter experts fall in my three prong criteria. The reason why we want to enlist these three prong criteria is to understand the holistic sense of a career transition for baseball players. The rationale in using a Delphi technique is to have mixed methods. So we're gonna have quantitative and qualitative. In rounds one, two, and three, we have quantitative. And in round one, we had that open-ended, I've kind of already mentioned this, um, the qualitative responses. This is when the participants were able to put in, write in their own responses um, in the qualitative piece. So the site was 100% online. Obviously, you guys know we're still going through COVID and everything. It was really efficient to, you know, use Qualtrics, send out an email, get these people to respond and do it quickly in a quick turnaround because we had a tight schedule. And keeping everything online allowed us to move quickly and continue to talk to people all parts of the world and really um, different busy schedules. The criteria that I mentioned, it, it is threefold. So player services, anybody who really touches an athlete, this could be a coach, a trainer, an agent, anybody who works in player development or front office, mental health, sports psychologist. I think you guys all know that mental health is important, but every team, I think every team at this point has a mental health, peak performance, mental skills coach or sports psychologist on staff. It is important to get them in there to understand that part of it so that we have the full picture. Um, so we had mental health sports psychologists as the next one. And the third final um, criteria is retired professional baseball players in the last five years. This is super important. We need to get their advice. We can't have people talking on behalf of players when we can have the players come sit at the table and add um, at least 33% of this um, criteria. The sampling for this was purposive and snowball, <clears throat> excuse me. So you know, basically what I did was I started with my network and asked people to add other people that fit this criteria. So the data collection was three, three rounds. Um, usually when you do a Delphi methodology, you want to use at least three rounds. Some go more. Um, I would say a lot go more. Um, but the data was collected and analyzed at, after each of these rounds. As I mentioned, round one was qualitative and quantitative. This is when the open-ended piece was. Um, sent out. So the sections that we establish here are demographics, situation, self, strategies, and support. I mentioned previously the 4S framework from Schlossberg and Kay. That's where this was used as the instrument. So we had the situation, self, strategies, support. Those are the four S's. They're going to be important to understanding how we got these findings, how the emergent factors came to be, and then at the end, how the development of the career transition model came to be. So round one, the scale was a little larger. It was a five point scale, not important, slightly, moderately, very extremely important. And as we start to um, go to the next rounds, we want to narrow that so we can um, begin to reach more of a consensus. And I'll explain a little bit more of how that process works. Round two was a scale. Um, this is when quantitative was only used and same thing with round three, quantitative was only used. Round two and three are crucial to follow round one, obviously because we wanted to reach a consensus. And that is the point of the Delphi method. So here's how we collected and analyzed the, the data. This was our coding process. And you could see the hand coding here from the qualitative responses in round one. And then the consensus that I mentioned. So Delphi looks to um, reach a stability in results. And to do that, you have to have some kind of measurement to say, hey, this is where we are going to say we've reached a consensus, right? In this, in this regard, we use the average percent of majority opinions, the APMO cutoff rate. What that means is that if the majority reaches over 50%, we have reached a consensus that this is an important key factor, right? From there, we've looked at the majority agreement, the majority disagreements, divided that by the number of expressed opinions from the participants. 
after we've identified that that um, one key factor, for example, has passed the measurement, right, has gone the majority over 50%, we have ranked those key factors on importance based off of the mean score. This is how we use the Delphi method to reach a stability and results and ultimately reach a consensus to say that this one has reached a consensus, we can move on with the ones that have not. And I'm going to get into exactly what those results look like. So here is the participant layout from each round. Okay, you can see here on the left, it's round one, two, and three. We had the total panelists. We started with 38. We went down to 31 who participated. You can see that the response rate got um, pretty good um, after round one. We did lose some people significantly after round one. I think it's because they saw the behemoth that I was asking um, from them. But the other thing I want you to look at is the panelists across the criteria to see how it's spread out from all of the panelists and the three prong criteria. So we have player services, mental health, sports psychology, again, and the retired players. Now, after round one, what we did was we asked them, of the factors that are here that were informed by the research, what is missing and what could be added? The participants added 17 key factors, which went hand in hand with my 16 that were already there, which gives us 33. In round two, we're going to see how which ones reached consensus, which ones were ranked based off of their mean score, and which ones were not reaching a consensus that had to move to the next round. So this is for the first section, situation. And then this is for the second section, self. So here we had a total of 14 that were informed by the research, eight that emerged from their responses to, for a total of 22. We also asked in the qualitative piece, what are strategies for coping and how could baseball players either use or have used strategies for coping? How important is mental health in the transition process? This validated the need to have mental health sports psychologists in the criteria, but also gave us the, the understanding that if this was a key factor, this was something that emerged from the responses that we could say, hey, this was important and this was needed. We did the same thing with social support system. How important is that in the transition process? And coping strategies, because we already asked what coping strategies did exist. We wanted to know how important those um, coping strategies were. Professional guidance. This is kind of a validation um, for me. And you know, as we talked about with my consultancy in the beginning, um, why there needs to be professional guidance, why there needs to be somebody um, involved in this process. And support available. This is more of a uh, reflective process here of asking what support did you have available and who provided that support is right here. This tells, hey, who was involved here? What do you know is out there? What do you know that you're be that you're utilizing or not utilizing? Then lastly, we asked the support strategies that they would recommend as a panelist. You can see here career development took the cake top answer there, exploration for pre-retirement, all the way down to more access to resources, support, enhancing skills to prepare. Okay, so now in round two, we told you that we had 33 in the situation section. You know, some emerged, some were informed by the research, but in this round two, we had 28 of the 33 reach consensus, meaning that they were all important. They were all something that the panelists felt were key factors. Five did not. I'm going to get into exactly what, what those five are. The five that didn't reach a consensus were these five, ability to relocate, family situation, the reason for transition, branding slash marketing, nutrition slash active or physical lifestyle. One of the things we found out is that the ones that didn't reach a consensus right away were very case by case. Um, you'll see at the end, some never reached a consensus. So in the self section, we had 22 and 20 of the 22 reach a consensus, okay? So here we go. Again, the ones that didn't, pre-retirement planning and religion. Now in round three, three of the five reached a consensus, ability to relocate, family situation, reason for transition, while branding, marketing, nutrition, active lifestyle did not. So we left round three with those two um, that they did it. And I think a lot of that is because it's case by case. You know, if you are big into branding, you are big into marketing, it might be something that can help you. If you do need a nutrition um, or active physical lifestyle, it might be case by case there too. 
In the self, we saw pre-retirement planning was something that did reach a consensus in round three, but religion is not. Religion was a very interesting one because it was really fluctuating in terms of the responses, high or low. And I think a lot of that is if you're a religious person, religion comes first and foremost. If you're not a religious person, it does not. So now that we can like interpret these results after the three rounds, it was good to see what themes emerged, how those key factors also became skills, right? That baseball players could either get, obtain or transfer from playing baseball. And what we really got here is with the three prong approach, we use our expert panelists and their perspective, their experience, um, them either being in the trenches with baseball players or having been a baseball player themselves. So to me, the results in my interpretation is we, we gathered specific needs to a specific audience through spe specific phases of their transition and of their life and of their, them going through retirement. All of this created the Mezzi Athlete Career Transition Model, which I'm going to call the MACT model because I like um, acronyms. So as we get into the conclusion, the things I want you to understand is the purpose always was to analyze, to understand, and to identify. We did that. We analyzed the perspectives on the career transitions for professional athletes. We included them into this process, and we identified the transition models that did exist and that we can kind of pull from a framework. The intent was to develop this career transition model that did emerge from this research. We're going to revisit the research questions that you guys can see there, and we've already talked about earlier in this presentation. So the first one what we found out is that coping strategies are important, but there are not many in place. That's very interesting to note because we need to enlist those people, the mental health, the sports psychologists, to understand exactly what strategies should be in place and then what is already in place and what isn't in place. Okay, the expert panelists recommended a need for career development, career exploration, and more access to resources and support. They, they recommended enhancing skills to prepare, to have a support system, and to have networking and mentoring. Understanding what programming exists and what doesn't will you know, validate this need and answer that question. Now, these are the key factors that emerge and we're gonna look at them from a, a four um, step process. It's really a phased approach that mirrors, but is not the, but is not the equivalent to a 4S framework. So the situation became home, right? So home is now the person. The person, the player is looking at these factors as they go from person to professional. So I've kind of uh, made this acute uh, framework that fits baseball. So we have home first, second, and third, and I'll show you the visual that helps to speak to that. And as they go from home to first, they go from personal to professional to the game plan. The game plan is the strategies that they have, have now understood that they need and that have been missing and that they can enlist if they want to help them through this transition process. The fourth is third base. So you go first, second, third, before you come back home to the personal, the team. The team is the support that you need, whether that's family, whether it's Major League Baseball, whether it's Major League Baseball Players Association, maybe it's your agent, maybe it's um, a mentor of yours that is either playing baseball or outside of baseball. That is the team aspect. So here we have personal, professional, the game plan, which is the strategies, and the team, which is your support. These four sections make up with the emerging themes and create the Mezzi Athlete Career Transition Model. That framework allows the needs um, that were addressed early, right, to, to approach this balance between current demands of a player as a player and anticipated future demands. So when you're becoming an athlete and you're ending your career and becoming, I guess, a regular person or a civilian, right? That's what these athletes have to go through and say, as I hang up my cleats, my shoes, whatever, and I'm no longer an athlete, what do I need? How do I approach that? When do I approach that? The whole point here is with these four sections and the newly developed model, it's designed to take act action in approaching this process in four parts, taking the list of key factors that are identified and ranked in importance from our expert panelists. Here's what um, really the whole reason we did this dissertation. This is the visual. Now, I'm not an artist. If anybody is, I would love to have your help to make this look much prettier, but it is a lot of key factors and they are all phased in that approach. So you can see home, first base, second base, third base. In first base, we broke it down to strengths, weaknesses, and transferable skills. My goal is to make this look much better in the next phase when we go um, to do further research with the MAC model. But as we approach the end, 
Um, the recommendations for me to, to take this into practice is to present these findings with the necessary organizations. The reason I presented the current dilemma with Major League Baseball and the Players Association with the um, CBA not being agreed on is I am not able to touch base with Major League Baseball or Major League Baseball Players Association. They will not talk to me. So where I thought I was going to go with this in August, when I defended my dissertation, I have not been able to go there yet. However, there is a need for this. I think they know about what I'm doing because I'm that persistent and annoying. But as a researcher, I want to act as the consultant or liaison between teams and the players, teams at Major League Baseball, teams in the Players Association. All of those entities are involved in this process. The Players Association is the advocacy for the players, which obviously makes sense. And that is somebody who I would like to approach with my research. The other thing I'm looking forward to doing, if we can get that far, and when we do, is to create a curriculum with mental health sports psychology services that are already being offered, already existing, and base that off of the four-phase uh, four approach, the action that you can take using the MAC model. Now, for further research, there's a lot that we can do. Other thing is, is to focus on one area or open um, the research to one key factor, investigate the urgency of the key factor. So how urgent is it for us to address the home? How urgent is it to dress first? Should we be doing this at a certain age? Should we be doing this at a certain um, single A, double A um, level of baseball? Should we be doing this at a skill level? Maybe they're 26 and they haven't gotten past double A. Should we address it then? As I mentioned, I want to create a curriculum. That's the same thing here. That's another research. You could take a curriculum model and, and bring that in here. Pilot study this using a group of baseball players, similar to what Amy Mobile did, but run it through with this model. Follow them through the step-by-step -step process. Maybe it's a longitudinal, longitudinal study over a course of time. Um, app application of this model, but to other sports and see what we can come up with using the same process, possibly the Delphi method. And then use this model for international baseball players and those athletes, because I do think that they'll have different needs. Um, you'll probably have like cultural simulation, language as higher ranked key factors than, than we did in this research. But to summarize, these are the things that I want you to walk away with. Professional baseball players all are vulnerable, vulnerable to being forced out of the game. There is a need for clarity on life after baseball. What does that look like? And there's a void in that programming, and there was no existing model before this research. So the MAC model is now positioned and can act as a resource and guide for professional baseball players that leave their sport and their job. I'm going to open it up to discussion and questions right right after I'm done this next two slides, but I wanna just float some questions to you um, to kind of keep that going. On the right here, you can see um, a tweet that I, it's really a thread, I guess, from um, Travis, who is a writer and is covering baseball, especially with this um, collective bargaining agreement issue. I just want you to take that in because we already showed you some numbers in the beginning, but this is super recent. So if this issue remains and continues, how can this research be implemented and to the right parties? That's the area I wanna explore, number one. And then number two, given this research area and the current exploration that I just did, in what direction should this momentum go? Should it go into practice with baseball players right away? Should we take a step back and look at international baseball players, look at other sports, or is there anything that I'm just totally missing? And that is all I have for you guys. I hope that you know this is a positive note going into the, the baseball season. Hopefully we can um, get a collective bargaining agreement agreed on and baseball can resume soon. Thank you. Well, thank you, Caleb. This was wonderful. Um, you're so passionate about your research and you can tell that uh, this is excellent and a very comprehensive presentation. Uh, I would like now to invite you to ask questions uh, related to Caleb's presentation. You can unmute yourselves and ask the question or you can type in the chat box below. Excuse me. Hi, I'm uh, Terea Hudson. Uh, I just had a question about um, your project and maybe as it relates to education, particularly, um, you know, students in areas where, you know, they really rely on sports to get into college to, um, you know, kind of further their careers. And it's kind of a different um, different situation for them. Do you see uh, a way that this model could maybe um, apply to students in school or looking at the next steps in their career trajectories, even if they're not planning on going pro? Yeah. So are you talking about high school, college, any level, or just wide open? 
uh, both high school and college really is what I was I was looking at. Yeah, I think high school would be a little trickier just because they do have the option to go to college or, you know, tech school or something um, similar. So I, I wouldn't say I, I could answer that clearly and confidently. For college, I, college athletes, I think it depends on the level, right? So D1, I think that the research will show that D1 athletes have more of a, a demand and focus on the sport. So while we call them student athletes, it's probably athlete student makes more sense. And in that regard, I don't think that they get, and this is case by case, school by school basis, that they don't get the same traditional experience that a student would get, right? So if that's the case, they might not be positioned well to transition. But if you look at the 4S framework, that's a, a framework that is involved with any transition, not just a career transition. That could be um, a mother going back to work. It could be a um, 65 year old going into retirement, a high school kid going to college. Right. So I think that that framework, looking at situation self and then going into strategies and support works with any athlete. I just think they have to look at the current environment that they're in. Right. Like I'm a teacher at Newman University where I work with D3 athletes. And I can tell you that the focus on um, athletics is a little different than it is at a D1 because I went to Temple for my undergrad and I was in classes with guys who went to the NFL and the NBA. So I could totally see that. Um, but I do think that the key factors that are in here could be applied, right? They just might differ based off of the D1, D3 level. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Anybody have any thoughts to my exploration areas? So either this one or the next. If we don't have any other questions, I can ask a question. I have a question, Caleb. Uh, what are some of the lessons learned from, uh, and, and also perhaps challenges uh, from conducting a Delphi method study? That is a great question. Uh, the Delphi, as I said before, is very tedious, Yeah. but it, yeah. It, it, it is really cool at the end to see that you had these expert panelists and they were able to create something, right? You're kind of like the conductor here of like, this is the round, this is the information you have to be quick in terms of collecting and analyzing that data. I would say that if I was to do something again, right, not that I don't like the Delphi, but for the sake of a dissertation and time, that I would probably do something more qualitative. But I really wanted to, I couldn't pick which method I liked better. I thought that they both had value. The other thing is, is I'm a practitioner by trade, or as um, the great Bill Sutton said, a pracademic. So I really enjoy the fact that you can use outside, meaning subject matter expert, to come in here. And I really wanted to do that. The beauty is that I was able to get the three prong criteria, the expert panelists, right? The hard part was the collection the analyzing the quick turnaround. I mean, I did not have a summer if you, if you want to be uh, truthful, but I think the Delphi has a really good, um, I guess, use for medical and healthcare. Cause that's where I, I saw a lot of research being used and that's where I hear about it a lot. Thank you so much. Just a quick comment. You didn't have a summer, but you, you have a doctorate. <laughs> I know. And I, and I can't wait. Congratulations. For summer. I can't wait for the summer. <laughs> Uh, anybody else? Do we have other questions? To either of the presenters. Okay. Let me check the chat. Uh, well, we have a lot of nice comments. So thank you all. Um, well, if we don't have um, any other questions, we'll just wrap up. Um, I'd like to thank both of our presenters, Dara Bright and Dr. Mezzi for presenting today. Um, both of their works are excellent. And I would like to thank all of you for attending the colloquium event series. The next colloquium event will be Friday, April the 1st from 12 to 1 p.m. Thank you so much and have a great weekend. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye.